What's up, guys? Luke here. Um, welcome to the podcast for this week. Uh, this week, we've got a very special guest. We've got Mark Flood from Renatus Cap- uh, Capital on the line, a, uh, a private equity firm. And this is kind of following on from our Brian Caulfield uh, episode that was really, really popular. Um, uh, he was telling us all about venture capital in Ireland uh, and his journey as well. So we're kind of doing a little bit of a, a roundtable about that. How, how are you doing, Mark Baker? <laughs> Good, good. Thanks, Luke. Uh, just so we, we won't get confused with the with the marks. You can refer yeah. to me as Baker for this if you want. Yeah. Um, but um, no, welcome, welcome, Mark, and thanks to uh, Tom McGovern actually, who who linked us in together. Uh, a mutual friend. It was a it was a great guy, and he's always helping. Le- out, legend, so. legend yeah. of a man. A legend yeah. of a man. Yeah. No, I don't know if I've, yeah. I've ever actually met him. Uh, in person, but he's, I know he's a big part, a, a big uh, friend for, uh, for Mark Baker here. And uh, loads of people that we've interviewed have been, have been uh, talking about him and also about how, you know, what a great guy he is. So shout out uh, to the McGoverns. <laughs> uh, yeah, Brian too. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so Mark, the, the whole uh, private equity uh, business, a lot of people out there that are listening, a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, uh, salespeople uh, working in tech, a lot of finance people as well because of because uh, of uh, Mark's industry. Um, so from a from a a big kind of overview of that, what would you, how would you describe private equity versus something like venture capital? Are they uh, two things that are very similar, or what would be the kind of biggest differences? Just to give some context to the listeners. Yeah, I, I think um, thanks thanks a million, Luke and Mark. Um, the Venture capital is a lot earlier in the in the gestation. If you take the if you take um, kind of we gave the analogy of stages of school once, and uh, people kind of like us to, to to say so. Like someone starts a business, it's um, friends and family at the start. So that's nearly like um, kind of preschool, if you like. You know, that's uh, then um, when they get to a stage where they're still early, like they may have revenue they probably don't have profit because um, they're growing so fast and everything's being recycled into the business. But that's when they're probably ready for the venture capital. Um, and that's what we call primary school, if you like, in, in the gestation of a business. And um, and then we're probably coming in at the next stage, if you like, nearly like second level, where where they're, they've established profits you know and that's generally where the where, where, where the private equity and you have different cadres of that but the um so they probably have established and generally like private equity is nearly as the same suggests in a sense that it's equity that's private so there's different there's, there's a lot of different forms of that you know but generally even even getting money directly from a high net worth that's at arm's length and you don't know <laughs> probably are going to have to be making in the range of a million quid, maybe half a million, but it, it, it puts you into that kind of probably of 250,000 existing Irish SMEs. It's probably 25,000, it's probably 10% making that bracket. So the bottom 90% are, are potentially earlier or smaller away from that. And then obviously people go on and get bigger fundraisings. They might go on and do IPOs and that's into your third third level work level doctors etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's it's uh i think if you were to uh i i think if you were to put one word beside venture capital you'd say early and okay. one word beside private equity you'd say established you know that's that's kind of the so interesting and how did you so let's kind of go back a little bit here um, and give some context for listeners as well um so you're from me originally right that's right. So yeah, still still living in Meath, proud Meath man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the the background was uh, like a like a horse far- a farming background, right? Yeah, yeah. That's from a from a from a family farm. I was I was the youngest son, so I was kind of was made clear at an early stage that I'd have to go out and, and, and work for a living. So, um, but I was uh, always buying and selling when I was younger, and uh, ducking and diving, and just loved business. Uh, I absolutely love business for me from your age you know. this has been something that i've been uh looking at into recently just because i'm following this guy on um it's, it's just, i find the kind of the farming business really interesting because it's so far away from what i, I what i do uh uh and software but uh, i've been following this guy called um 
are on YouTube called uh, Our Wyoming Life. And he's like a rancher out there and he goes into the business of the whole thing. And I just can't get enough of it. Every week he puts up like, all right, this, this week he's going to cost fences and stuff like that. And I'm like, there's so many moving parts of this. Um, so when you, were, uh, when you were growing up, would that have a big impact on you? Was it kind of a business all the time? Uh, was it kind of business around the, the dinner table, that type of thing? Yeah, it's a live business. It's it's uh, so even my dad at home would have had. Um, I suppose our, our business at home was was uh, stallion, so like breeding horses. So the the the, the mare owner comes and um, pays the nomination to the stallion. So you can you can you can make any uh, comparables you want to that to the, to the real world. But uh, it's uh, yeah, so it's it's clearly the biggest, the well known business in Ireland would be cool more, but there's a lot of um there's a lot of independence out there as, as as well as some of the global giants. So um our guys at home would have, would have done a lot of that. So you, you kinda had everything it was um it was three hundred and sixty five days, twenty four seven and um it was yeah the the phone at home was always the was was, was the nerve center and uh I remember at times there was a there was um, a wing binder and we all had to kind of take notes of the phone, but when it was busy, you could have 50, 60 calls a day. And uh, that was, that was our CRM at the time, if you like <laughs> taking, uh, taking uh, notes on a ring binder, but no, it's great. I think anyone, I, I'd, I'd go further than that from a farming family. Like I just think anyone in business, um, we've one investor who, who tells us just hire the child of a farmer or a publican and you won't go wrong. But I'd extend that to a kind of a, someone that's been brought up in an entrepreneurial background in the sense that, you know, like one good friend who's, who's, whose dad worked for a council, but he kind of had his own business at nighttime and painting. And you know what I mean? Like that was self-employment of sort. It's a, it, the definition is, but I, I think, um, I think when people have been brought up with the fact that, the, you know, the door doesn't close at 5 p.m. and business is 24-7 and you're not guaranteed your, you're not guaranteed your money to pay the, to pay the wages. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, I think when people have been brought up in that, it's um, I think it's it's even the the Jeff Bezos as well. Like that's his his inspiration was his rancher stepfather or whatever. Like you know what I mean? Like it's it's I think when you go through it, uh, I think it definitely helps in um, it definitely helps um, to kind of get an understanding for business and the the the. the the, the, the crap that can happen if you like you know what I mean like it's it's I, I think for anyone in business it's definitely uh, I talk to a lot of people who are hiring and I definitely think people would put a positive algorithm on or a positive weighting on their algorithm for anyone that's maybe not even from a family but have run their own business in college or they've run their own like it's just priceless experience to you know you can you can like driving a car you can learn it in the classroom but you can't you know what I mean like so anyone who's just lived it either by virtue of their, their family their partner themselves it's just nothing beats experience because it's, uh, it's 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 tough yeah it's something that we've talked about before as well it kind of what it was driving different uh entrepreneurs that we've had on here and the the family background is a big one as well so um so like my on my father's side all my they're all self-employed they had singer sewing machine shops or they had a like a like a furniture removal business all these kind of little side hustles that seem to be a little bit more uh, pre- prevalent uh, maybe back in the 70s and 80s but um it is it's very interesting that kind of gets kind of almost passed down um after, after yeah that- and I, I think it's i think it's i think that's part of ireland as well like you know like it, it, there's never like the can't there's nobody more than one generation away from that and some guys like you know what i mean like from it's it's like um not not to but like with the urbanization and everything that happened in in and in the, within the industrialization in the uk there's probably like like if you probably went into a a third level class of a hundred in the uk with largely uh indigenous population and the same in ireland i think you'll definitely get more hands up for one 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 or two generations away from real entrepreneurship if that's a, a, a running the sewing machines if that's that's uh, farming, pubs, any other form of self-employment. But I, I, there's definitely, and that's why, you know, that's why you look at a PLC base. I think that's why the Irish do so well internationally is just the, the entrepreneurial spirit. It's just, it's, it's in us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so after, after the kind of the, the, the farm life, where did, you went to university in Galway. What would you study over there? Big commerce in Galway, and um, but it would have been kind of you know a lot of other things concurrently. 
and uh, we did try that. We, we did set up some businesses, and some went well, some went not so well. But it was it was uh, it was great fun, and um, the uh, went on to do a masters, and then was kind of considering going full time at a startup that we kind of set up, which was text messaging for for clubs, largely GA clubs before kind of team team or any of the web text got going and long before WhatsApp. And yeah. uh, it was good, but we probably we ran a pilot. And it, it was kind of, it was, it was kind of the test base all liked it, but you kind of said, well, we go with this full time or not, and then decided to go and do, um, do accountancy nearly by process of elimination as much as anything else, because it was kind of, uh, BDO sold a good story at the time where it was a graduate to say, well, this isn't, you know, you're actually dealing with all owner founders here, and this is a great, a great potential to, immerse yourself in that and it was in fairness uh in fairness to them like i, I think it's um they were big enough to be substantial businesses but not so big to be kind of removed from the founder and uh went in and did um the two years of uh audit which is very retrospective detailed and um uh, you're looking backwards there's a lot of detail but you're kind of getting out into into businesses which was kind of good and good osmosis and you get to learn how 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 an accounts uh, department work and what all the different roles do so it didn't feel like it at the time but it was kind of it was good experience in retrospect to kind of know what what that function does you know what I mean so for business now two years now it definitely gives you a feel for what people do who are receiving the money collecting the money and um, creating the accounts working it through so it was it was kind of painful enough but it was good experience and then thankfully got um uh, got switched to the corporate finance department and corporate finance as a discipline, you know, you might look at an accountancy house, but there's probably, I don't know, maybe 5% of the seats in the, in, in, in the office are maybe for corporate finance. And that's uh, really real estate agents for business to a certain extent, buying, selling, advising, and just absolutely love that. You can only learn the mercy on them was, uh, was, 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 our, was the partner I kind of worked under with, um, with uh, he, he flanked, Paul Keenan and David Hargan and um and it was just a great team there and the alumni from that team um when I looked at who my people who were three, five, seven years older, they've all gone on to do great things. And um it was a great it was a great house. So I actually only had probably a, a year in that department and bumped into Peter Crowley and Neil Hughes. Again, it was kind of concurring with me qualifying and I was kind of thinking of I had a share of bookmakers pitches in Galway and Cheltenham when I had different things going on where I was kind of thinking that I go down that road and um, completely I changed just clicked out. with the two boys the racing industry then sorry would, Luke? That, would that be a complete a complete like pivot out of uh, accounting to go into the the kind of the uh, the racing book space or it would be yeah yeah potentially I was probably moonlighting a lot in that world anyway and and, and uh, probably doing better from that than I was from the day job but um it was, uh, but then came across Peter Crowley and Neil Hughes. Peter was head of IBI corporate finance, who were um, probably the biggest corporate finance entity in, in Ireland. And uh, and Neil Hughes had done a lot of the early fundraisings for Dennis O'Brien. And uh, it's Neil with a double L. Uh, not to be confused with the with the Baker Tilly. Uh, Neil and Neil um, and Peter went out on their own with a kind of a vision for private equity. And, uh, and they... Kind of formed uh, an ecosystem at the time, maybe a little bit earlier than them. There was the Ion Equity guys were out, then the um, Niall McFadden, uh, Niall McFadden was out, and, and Lion Court. So it was kind of uh, that was probably the first. There was probably four houses and maybe one or two more, and uh, they were the first kind of formal private equity in Ireland in a sense like you know what I mean there may have been a generation before where there was kind of ICC Capital and Fitzwilton and Tony O'Reilly's entity and something like that but it was kind of so they were effectively very smart guys who were looking at interesting businesses and deploying private capital a little of which was their own but a lot of which was kind of brokered from private individuals so it was probably in an Irish sense for the private equity ecosystem it was probably version you know, maybe it was version two, but it was version one or two, and it's kind of evolved now to be more a group of funded funds with kind of brass plates over the door, and that's all they do. And uh, those those guys all did so well; <laughs> they kind of have become family offices in their own right, and uh, and high net worth, the guys you mentioned. 
so uh, so Peter and Neil were 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 were, were um, setting up, and I was absolutely fluked that I kind of came across them at the right time, and uh, they, they 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 brought me on the journey. So it was kind of two men and a dog. I was the dog, you know. So uh, it was as a, as a qualified, it was fantastic. So it's and, like uh, that was just a roller coaster. All happening, just to give some time. Right. So th- this is like uh, three or four years post college. A post university, yeah, year. yeah, yeah, just just graduated, yeah, probably probably mid twenties, and then um, it was it was quite a roller coaster. The, the market was high, looked an awful lot of things, and uh, in fairness, they walked away from a lot of things at the top. But uh, by fluke of network, I introduced them to a guy, and that that was in February two thousand and seven, and that led to six months later us writing a hundred and seventy million sterling check for the Racing Post, which was uh, kind of a surreal journey. And um, I had spent my youth selling newspapers outside Mass at home. I wrote for the local newspaper on racing. I was the school bookmaker. I can handle a lot of horses. I'd done a lot of things. So uh, pretty much uh, a waste of youth kind of came together and said, "God, I'm actually, you know." Uh, Love this business and Alan who we brought in who was buying in as MD asked me to go on the journey with them to be his kind of flanker and um, so I joined the senior management team there in 2007 and uh, September and it's, it's no boast it's more a fact and an observation it was probably the last big check that Anglo-Irish wrote oh really in, in, so it's just in, yeah um, yes, the timeline is just there towards the, the teetering end of uh, that kind of uh, that yeah kind of September September uh, yeah so look at it was it was quite a journey and in, in the business in fairness it tipped off a little but nothing like what like if you look at the share prices of Trinity Murr at the time or Independent or Daily Mail they tanked because they all had B two C consumer revenue we most of ours was covered price sales and and and, and bookmaker revenue so it, it kind of was quite resilient it wasn't the mean but it was a lot more resilient and uh as a, as a group we did a lot of good things in between but the the big black swan was mo- getting into mobile and that transformed the business and uh we, we kind of got the anglo went into cape went into a kind of a process and we we got out of that um we we came out of that and subsequently sold the sold the business um and the, the business plan we had in 2007 was largely delivered but it might have it was probably a five-year business plan delivered in eight years you know so it was um was fantastic experience for me to go from like i think you can kind of you can get a little bit um i i suppose presenting on powerpoint and excel hundreds of millions and here's a business making 17 you're doing this you kind of you don't have a full appreciation for the roots of what's there when you go in and run a business, you have appreciation for the roots and the absolute A to Z of what's involved in that. And like newspapers, just fascinating logistics business whereby, at, and even in this day and age, and you can imagine how it was years ago, like at 10 o'clock, somebody's finishing a thing and then at six o'clock the next morning, every every um, news agent in the country, like 50,000 in the UK, had this paper on their, on, on their shelves. It's just amazing. Like I can't print a sheet now this day working in a home office like you know what I mean like it's it's uh when you think of the logistics it's uh so the it's an amazing an amazing um uh kind of value supply chain and uh look it was great fun I was uh it brought me to London in, in in my 20s which was which was uh which was a great great experience as well so yeah it's great crack absolutely and it's like I said, it's such an interesting business to go in, go into. And me and Mark have been talking about this the last few weeks as well with the people that have been on. It's if you open your mind to different types of business, there's so many diff- interesting ways to to kind of generate a profit in, in different industries. Like you're talking about the the, the racing post from an outsider uh, view of that. It seems like that's a, a newspaper, like any other newspaper. But you're saying that there's way more moving pieces in there. You're getting uh, revenue from completely different streams than your your typical um your typical uh, newspapers so when you went in there did you like change a, was there like a, a big turnaround at that stage for that uh, business or was it just kind of well, i suppose it was alan led it and i was uh, yeah alan Byrne led it and i was supporting him along with the other senior management team but uh like everything victory has a thousand parents to feed as an orphan so when the when the thing was declining in profits it wasn't it wasn't my idea but uh when uh when when we ended up with um 
you know, with the mobile business that completely transformed the business. It was everyone's idea, you know. So uh, it was it was a good good team effort. Yeah, like it it it's um, but probably the big problem that the big problem that um, you know there's there's time, can be a stigma around gambling and look at um, maybe it's self rationalisation, but in racing post it's a skill game. People are looking at kind of an opinion and a, like I, I think most of the problem in gambling arises from non skills roulette and things like that, you know what I mean, where where it's, um, you know, where, where there's absolutely no opinion, no skill, so um, 100% of racing post is, 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 is all on skill, skill betting on, a, on an event, and um, to, to um, most publishers can't convert their eyeballs into, uh, into, into dollars, but we were lucky that we can, uh, our eyeballs on the app could go and have a transaction and a bet. So, um, nice. so it's it's it was very 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 uh, fortunate to be on that kind of value chain, which the business now is 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 thriving under new ownership. But Alan is still there, and it's great to see. And uh, it's gone from strength to strength, but it's it's it's, it's, it's great to see. What's what's the transition then after that? When you, when that's kind of done and dusted, I know that's eight years is a big, it's a big chunk of uh, your life at that stage. Did, did you think about? Uh, like doing something completely different or did you uh, have your eye on starting um, uh, Renatus at the same no, time? No, I loved, loved um, yeah, loved, just loved business. And uh, so uh, loved business and kind of cut short to a certain extent with Peter and Neil and FL Partners in then um, cut short in that we kind of got into racing post and just started to love business. And um, Brandon, trainer was my boss in BDO so we kept in touch with him and uh, we were kind of maybe doing a bit of moonlighting looking for potential investments in business and we said you know what we gotta if, if we're gonna make a go of this we gotta put a sign over the door and take this serious so we said let's raise let's try and raise 10 or 15 million and thankfully we raised uh, 11 million from people who were backing us and the sell to them was um do you think there's opportunity in SME Ireland to to um, to back good companies and help them on their journey to become great? And they said yes, and then um, which is positive. And then the second fell was, um, are you going to, you know, select, screen, manage, you know, go to Kerry, go to Derry to source. Uh, to source these uh, and to mine them and they said god no that's too messy and they said uh, well right <laughs> there is an opportunity you're not going to go and do it so you've got the money we've got the time let's come together that's effectively the sell and um, and pitched in such a way that they allow us you know probably eat bread and butter uh, you know we can eat bread and butter from, from running the, the thing but we don't get jam until, uh, <laughs> until the very end when they get jam which is great it's aligned the way it should be and uh, so we're kind of uh, it's, it's enough to keep us focused and that, that we've signed over the door and we can dedicate ourselves to this and um, the um, so like it's a great model on all fronts so their capital has been well aligned to us our capital then is well aligned to our partners and uh and it's 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 um if we if we, if we all do well um everyone will do well so that was yes yeah, so we set out uh with 11 million and uh we, we we pitched ourselves in such a space where we weren't venture capital to our earlier point like it wasn't the earlier stage companies we weren't investing in asset backed properties or pubs or hotels uh, we weren't in public listed stocks so we were in this kind of top 10 percent of irish smes we had four traffic lights uh, for our criteria and they remain today whereby businesses were making a million plus in profits you know you would call it profits EBITDA cash generated but generally they make near a million quid um, and that there's a plan or prospects to double <laughs> um, and a, a, a good team incumbent or we could bring them in that really knew the business uh, and then a, a sensible deal for everybody around the table, you know. So it's it's um, you know we've had we can talk about that again, but that's uh, you know there can be unrealistic expectations, but there has to be uh, you know if you're somebody who's who's say got a got a, a business with a comparable 
business in the PLC space and they think they're worth a lot more on a multiple of profits, but you can just go and buy the PLC stock and not, you know what I mean? So there just has to be reasonable expectations on value around the table. So they, they were the four criteria and thankfully we got our hands on three of those and uh, we've had amazing journeys on, on each one of those three uh, and, um, and, 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 and then raised the 35 million funds uh, which has got us into the next bracket, uh, but still the same size businesses. And, uh, and now we've, we've, we've affectively a team of nine people. And uh, so, so the, the, it still, it's kind of feels like we're moving from startup to established, you know what I mean? Like it's still, yeah. there's still growing pains everywhere. I'm still doing, you know, going through stuff today to get our VAT return final. And, you know, there's still self-employed from our side, but we definitely have it got to a scale where we're moving from to be more of a brand than an established entity from a, from a kind of a out of breath startup. You know. Absolutely. And it's something that we and Mark had actually talked about just beforehand, because sometimes we have a, a chat about uh, the guests just to kind of see kind of what, where the, our curiosity is and stuff like that. When we're looking at this, this business, when it first starts, um, you go, you've done the, the sales pitch uh, in, in a way to get the, uh, the initial investment. Um, you've got, uh, like I said, you're, you're going to be like the, the guys who aren't, aren't uh, bothered about, you know, scouring the country for the best uh, best value investments. Um, where where do you start the next day? Or, or do you guys have a couple of targets that you've put in your in your original pitch that you're thinking would be good targets for this? Or are you guys you say like starting from scratch? The names over the door. Let's uh, it's kind of almost like brainstorming on. Yeah, we had a yeah at the very start we had um in fact we had um Bougian was very close to being agreed so we kind of had a had a so like it's kind of so the, the investor says. Yeah, that sounds great. Have you any examples? And then we kind of have Bougian was our was was, was our, our first anchor. Cool. And with with the Bougian Bougian one, so to give you like I Bougian kind of emerged during the the kind of burrito, uh, the, the the new kind of uh, burrito era when I was in college. When I just started college, there was like burritos and blues. There was uh, Bougian. There was. I think there was a few other ones, but Bougian was always the one that stuck out for everybody. They did the best when it came to, uh, you know, if you get 10, you get a free t-shirt. And that was almost like a badge of honor that my friends would be wear going with. It kind of, it was different than the, a lot of the other ones. Um, how did you guys come across that, that investment? And um, like, how, how big is that? Are they, they're in all different, they're all over the place now, right? I think there was only one or two back then, but they're, it's a kind of a big... Yeah, there was one or two in Dublin at the time, two in Belfast, and one in Galway. So they kind of had got to a point where they had a, they had a, a an established chain, and um, the guy who had it at the open the sixth, he might have had a nervous breakdown. You know what I mean? He was all going through his mobile phone, so uh, he had three great people with him, and uh, and they kind of went ground up, and they've become the leaders of the business now, really. But David Maxwell came in with us, and he'd run a chain, so he brought he kind of went backwards before he went forwards and put a lot of systems in, you know, it was like the five chains, five stores, some were yellow, some were blue, some were pink. You know what I mean? Like he standardized the brand, standardized the front end of the brand, standardized the operations, standardized a lot. of. So he kind of, um, the, like the, the, the proposition was nailed by the previous guys and did amazing from a scratch to get it from a proposition to, to, to the business he had. But it kind of, so he nailed it but probably hadn't it configured in such a way to scale it. And then that's what David did with the, with the, with the senior management team and brought in a, a couple more to really get it to a point where, you know, pre-COVID with 18 stores open uh, and a national brand, you know, so it's, it's uh, I suppose he's, he's probably, uh, he, he's done to Ireland what Chipotle did to the, to the States really like, you know what I mean? And we'd like to think uh, better, but it's, it's uh, it, the business is the it's the people in it, the brand, and uh, so like it's it's um, we're 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 really in the stands and privileged to do so, you know. Absolutely, and is that something that or when you're doing your when you're doing an investment like that in there, are you saying when it gets to a certain amount, that's when it's time to to sell, or is it more kind of like a long term play, like ten, fifteen years? How does that work? Yeah, it can be. It can be the default private equity traditional is a kind of a, a five year plan and um that's that's the default you can kind of uh, that's no harm anyway because you can't see anywhere beyond it but thankfully we're so flexible with our 
we're, we're private, private equity. We've no institutional backing, so we can be flexible. And we're now kind of deep in in a, in a plan and vision to see can we can we take on the UK and see what's because uh, it's it's um I'll, I'll cross the water. Uh, we've already been very successful in in, in Stirling Land and Belfast and. Uh, Belfast is a, if you like, a, <laughs> a top twenty sterling city, and if we can, if we can do to the other cities what we've done to Belfast, there's a, there's a crack in business here. So, yeah, so we're we're fluid. Like I think the the um, I think it's always good to set a five year plan. It's no different to set a, a six ten week exercise program. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't mean you're not going to exercise beyond this, but you you kind of set it, and uh, and we're in that phase now where in version where version one was was the original founder taking it to five, version two was us maxing out Ireland. Um, version three now is 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 is, uh, is bringing it across the water. Uh, you know, people of Britain deserve it. We're going to bring it to them. Absolutely. I love to see the those uh, French guys eating those uh, those uh, bougie deliciousness. Hey, Mark Baker, you look like you have a question there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I've been quiet. Sometimes I like to let Luke uh, do all the talking there. But um, mm. no, look, there's a few things I picked up on, and and just to kind of go just back a bit, I'm uh, there were some things that you said that hit home with me from my experience i in college i was quite entrepreneurial after college i i did art I paintings and stuff and i did that full time for a year and then it was too risky so i went into a big four firm became an auditor and um, but the kind of entrepreneurial spirit never left me um and i sometimes felt and i, and I know you did corporate finance and, and in bdo you were dealing with smaller companies i was fs audit in in deloitte so that was that was nothing like you know being a being an entrepreneur you you mentioned before that you did a link or you you kind of studied the link you did a thesis on can accountants be entrepreneurs am i right about that you are yeah and that's that's i i kind of i wouldn't put this put it forward as a contribution to 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 academic uh to, to, to the world of academia, it was more a loophole that I, I didn't do an accounting thesis. So I said, how can I do, how can I spend the summer reading about entrepreneurs as opposed to fucking doing some, doing some uh, thesis on accountants? So so we did the master's in accountancy. So what we did was, I, I, I managed to get the title. It was, um, it was, um, can, is an accountancy qualification a good precursor to entrepreneurial success? And uh, read a lot. And it was fascinating. I loved it. Something like because you're just reading, reading, reading on on entrepreneurs and same themes. Like effectively, effectively, what they're saying is that <laughs> entrepreneurs are so unique you can't put them in a box and say it's X Y Z. But there is the kind of thing of you know uh, internal locus control, controlling their destiny. They're actually less risk takers than you think because they want to kind of they're more control freaks than risk takers. <laughs> uh, the risk is, is is potentially leaving your career in in the hands of of of. Uh, of, of some uh, senior manager in, in a firm and um, that's riskier than going and setting up yourself so 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 yeah it's fascinating to learn that and then but back to the accounting part the finding like it wasn't it was never going to be conclusive when you'd oh no it's been three months doing it but um the two big things i found was that the propensity of an accountant to go out and set up a business is probably lower because there is that kind of safer steadier other side of the brain and um, so that's that's fact and it's largely kind of support it, if you know what I mean, but of those that do, uh, like I called for my fellow uh, academics to do more research, I'm not sure if they did, <laughs> if anyone read it, but uh, it was more that the probability of success is probably higher, like when, when you're interviewing the accountants, it wasn't like, oh fuck, if, 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 if the fat man came that day, I was out of business, it was a bit more measured, you know what I mean, like they, they kind of planned what was involved a bit more and, 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 and there was less kind of a hit and hope to us. So I was saying that the probability of those who do accountancy that go on to set up their own business is potentially higher because they've kind of, they've, they've, um, they may, they may have planned it a bit more, but, uh, so in summary, my guess is that there'll be less, uh, there'll be less, um, there'll be less entrepreneurs coming out of, out of accountancy houses than uh, (laughs) anywhere else. But those that do are probably are well set, you know? Yeah, well, that I think the skill set of an account accountancy qualification is is obviously you know very going to be very good for for start running a business. Probably more for running a business than actually starting a business. In fairness, and that's why you'd see most you know C- CEOs might be accountants originally, um, as opposed to people who kind of take a risk and start to start a company. But um, 
But then again, there's the, yeah. Well, there's the CEOs the, are yeah, and in in some businesses, yeah, like the, there's a great line that the CEOs sometimes are more farmers and the founder is the hunter. You know what I mean? So there's kind of that. Uh, so they're very they're very steady. They're very steady farmers. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 they're great custodians for business, but you know it's it's where you hit the definitions, and then even within. What's an accountant? You know what I mean? Like like someone who does corporate finance as a deal maker, auditors maybe more steady, tax is very kind of creative, Michael Leary can true tax and you know, you, 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 there's different strands within it, like you know what I mean? So it's yeah. it's uh just a, a catch all isn't necessarily uh isn't necessarily right, you know. Yeah, and there's, there's the assumption that you're kinda of born an accountant as well. I certainly I, I kinda of would have been an entrepreneur that went into accountancy and then came out the other side. Yeah, you know, so not every, not every accountant is a kind of a typical accountant. That really helped you guys when you were raising money, though. When you were going out looking for in- investment, your your business plans were really on point. <laughs> you know, can compare. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. I understood yeah. the, no, the no, forecast no. and still do. Well, try to. <laughs> I wasn't the best accountant in the world. Yeah, being, the, being, being, being an accountant, uh, raising money is great branding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why I have that ACA after my name everywhere. <laughs> I go. Still yeah, it's great branding, so you can kind of give us, give us, give us, give us your credibility potentially. Like you know, if if you don't deserve it, it yeah. uh, as I say, someone, someone kind of, uh, you know, someone comes in and they're they've got a kind of a more creative background or came through other verticals. You're kind of saying have they any substance, and then someone comes in as an accountant, you're saying have they any spark. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of a bit of uh, yeah. I don't think Mark Baker, the artist, is getting as much money as, as Mark Baker, ACA. Put it that way. Depends on the... the uh, delayed gratification. It's, it's uh, the, the great artist. None of the great artists made the money in the early years. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's it, yeah. So, Mark, so you, the, the company's been open for five years, right? Um, you started uh, this particular company five years ago, right? Yeah, Renatus was five years ago. Yeah, we're probably in the station two years before that, so it's probably um, yeah, so we're probably uh, public five years and kind of okay, and, and, seven years. <laughs> and have you uh, over that time have you met with like, like a huge amount of of companies, or is it kind of just are you casting a wide net when you're looking for opportunities? That's what I mean. Or is it is there yeah, we are ones in there. Yeah, we narrow it narrow it down by that. Is it you know those traffic lights? You know, but we get to see an awful lot. We've had um, we've the best job in the world. You know, like we've we've um, the well, I have for what I want to do. If you know what I mean, like someone else might think it's it's not that exciting, but I I I, I couldn't think of a better job in the world. Like we've had more than a thousand through our pipeline, and in pretty much all cases, you're dealing with the founder and uh, like their they're just every founder is is unique but they have to be like the founder of a business uh like they are the marketing director they are the operations director they are the finance director they are every director at a point in time you know what i mean so they're just phenomenal people whoever uh and it's it's so like they they it's it's all very well when there's established entrepreneurs and they're making loads of money and it's all great and it looks easy but like the they had to start at a point where they couldn't see where they were going. <laughs> I mean, like they just, uh, they might have had a far vision, but they just, they had times where they couldn't pay the wage bill, but they have had to go in to run every function. Like, you know, so like it's, it, and in a way that's the, the, the scaling is fascinating because like all you're really trying to do is over time is clone people to be as good as, as good as that person in a, in, in, in a, in a category, you know what I mean? Like, cause if all the founder was doing was stuck in marketing, probably be better than any marketing director you could get, you know what I mean? Like, but doesn't have, you have to spend time in, in sales or in operations or in, so hasn't time to do that. So you gotta get, and that's just the fascinating, like if you look at our logo, the same, it's kind of like inspired by the Jim Collins, good to great. But like, I think that's the, um, that's the fascinating inflection point where we're at, where you're trying to get, you're trying to nearly build out um, functional excellence uh, to because to, it's all generally in the founders' heads. It's it's uh, and they're functionally they're generally functionally excellent at everything, but there's only it's that bandwidth issue. You know? Absolutely. And do you have any 
like uh, the verticals or anything that you're really interested in, where, as in, say, like some are, well, is there any areas or companies are saying that's a great company, the founder is great, everything like that? I just don't, it's not something that we want to get into. Or is there any, are you guys kind of agnostic about the, the industry as long as the, the fundamentals are always? Uh, yeah, probably um, like, there's sector and subsector, if you know what I mean. And um, there's sector and subsector, and we're probably we're more tuned now into subsector. You know what I mean, in the sense that um, we're um, there's certain subsectors within it that uh, so we kind of have green, amber, red sectors, and then within it, it's subsectors. So like, but the ones we'd be very interested in are at the moment, and, and generally would have been anyway, but suppliers to food and pharmaceuticals because they're just kind of. They're generally on that old school supply chain and they're trading on or ahead in, in this world and we expect for the next 18 months, not that we expect, but we're prepared for the next 18 months of fucking snakes and ladders for what we've had, you know, so they're very interesting. And then, um, and there's just some others that, um, there are just some others that we we just don't, it's another man's game, you know what I mean? Like potentially, like, you know what I mean? Like it's, 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 um, that, 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 as regards the sectors that we don't touch, there are probably others that just are what we call another man's game. They're more suited to maybe one person leading the investment than a whole, and they're not really growing in any in any in any guys like you know what I mean. Like so, like distributors with no value add. Like there's some great businesses making a few million out there, but it's just not made for us. It's made for that founder that has a relationship with the original brand owner or somebody else. Like you know what I mean. Like to to take it, but for us to come in. The brand, the owner to leave, who has the relationship with the key person, generally a distributorship's done in a handshake or something, just doesn't suit us as much, you know. So, it's it's the nature of the company rather than the actual sector in, in a way. The reason why I ask is because I know that the I guess the second investment you guys made was in um, uh, SimTech Aviation. Hello, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was looking at the SimTech Aviation. And I, I didn't realize that was in Dublin, but uh, I looked at the the facility. Looks like something out of uh, you know NASA or something. It's uh so it, it's a big change from the the Boojum, uh business. And uh, with that type of business, yeah. is that something that you'd look to expand to the UK and stuff like that as well? Or yeah, like I, I suppose the if you take it, they both shared the characteristics where they make them. A million, yeah, pretty much both of them were. Was there a plan to double? Yes. Was there great people involved to bring them? Yes. And was there a reasonable deal? So, so like they 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 take that box as opposed to the sector, and uh, it's just been it's been fascinating. Um, aviation is a community in Ireland, and uh, like they're just uh, like it's it's you have a group of people like we have a group of instructors out in SimTech instructing. And these are people who were, you know, maybe in their late twenties were maybe salespeople or school teachers, and 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 they just loved aviation. And like it wasn't an industry then, you know what I mean? Like so, somebody in their seventies now, it wasn't. An, and and they felt they just they're so passionate. There's a glint in their eye. They're so passionate about the business and feel so lucky to have been in it. And then everyone, it's 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 just an amazing. Uh, amazing community so um with regard to expansion you know, we've invested in a new machine to kind of we're probably the biggest pre-trainer of pilots in europe when i say pre-trainer we don't do the the kind of if someone spends maybe 120 grand becoming a pilot they've probably spent 115 grand before they come to us doing everything in the air and getting kind of familiar on their systems or whatever else that, that they've done that Maybe in Florida, maybe in Spain, but generally in warmer climes, there are there are options in Ireland. Um, but they've generally done that, and this is kind of like finishing school where they they might do kind of uh, flying in, in a multi crew environment with a with a previous kind of a senior that's the early English or Ryanair captain showing them what to do, and then that gets them kind of ready to go into a. <laughs> ready to, 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 to go into the real world. And um, that's, uh, yeah, so look, it's fascinating, fascinating space. So we have invested to double the capacity and then we're, we're also very close on some big international B2B contracts where, uh, where we're kind of bringing bandwidth into that. Um, but it's, it's, uh, 
fascinating industry, fascinating space. But again, we, we kind of, we, we wouldn't have done that business without keeping the founder involved, Shay Party, who was a co-founder, but the, the, the aviation brains of the business and uh, we're big on kind of keeping the DNA in a business as well. You know what I mean? Like, so kind of, um, you know, Shay had a kind of a, a conflictish position in his head where he was kind of saying, well, I want to sell, but I want to stay. <laughs> you know, he, he had a long journey as a founder and he's kind of saying, well, should I stay or should I go? And uh, thankfully, we, 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 we fulfilled both for him. We, 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 we allowed him to sell off some of the business and uh, he's, he's, he stayed on the journey to, to hopefully see what he found it become a global, a, a, a real global leader. And um, I think it's a great case study because some vendors and people in businesses think, you know, do I sell? Do I stay? Lose, lose potentially. So there's a kind of a hybrid where you can kind of monetize some success. You know, don't have all your eggs in the one basket. Do do what you do. Pay down the mortgage. Look after the. You know, <laughs> get the holiday home. Look look after your partner. Look after the kids. Look after whatever else, and uh, and and enjoy the fruits. But still stay and uh, still stay. And why should you sell all? The best place for your money is invested in the company you know you know so it's it's um we're big on that really trying to trying to um and there's an education in that with founders that it doesn't have to be uh it doesn't have to be um all stay all go you know so it's it's uh it can be the what we call the the, the curry chips half and half <laughs> exactly uh that's cool so the with the the type of business, it's really interesting for us as well because we're our, we're we're a really small country, right? And sometimes when it depends on the background and stuff like that, but maybe people don't understand how successful businesses can be in Ireland. So when I when I was working in, with the SME sector in the Nordics for the last three years or so, um, I was really taken aback by how confident they were uh, in their businesses. A really small if they're just like just getting started up in very you know traditional. Uh, industries or whatever, um, and then when I was talking to people uh, working those co- those companies in Ireland, they weren't as uh, and they were not not that they weren't ambitious, but they weren't as confident. And I think that's a, kind of something we need to kind of put a stamp on in Ireland and really try to teach teach the younger people that we're, we can be world beaters here. There's so many companies that are dominant, you know, from Ireland. Um, so with the, the the founders that you that you're meeting, um, are most of them like I said, are most of them from a background where they've learned a business and then like the aviation uh, people, they kind of do that somewhere else and then say, I want to go out on my own? Or is it just like, there's nothing like here in Ireland and they just started from scratch? Yeah, they saw the show was in, in, in their lingus and, and started started that way, got a, got a, um, worked for lingus and saw that there was no, you know, there needed to be a housing someplace that housed the simulators and, 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 and trained the pilots. So, so got in that way, but I would agree. Like there's a, a like I, I don't think, in a way, does it make a difference as to where they end up? But like there's a there's a humility and nearly an inferiority complex among entrepreneur community. Like like they're kind of, and even say some people might look at professionals in Dublin and kind of nearly look up to them, and they've, it's quite the opposite. Like <laughs> they would buy and sell anybody, and they don't realise how how good they are. They're just fucking like, it's, it's, um, as I said, they could be, a they could be, you know, there's one particular industry, look at the guy and say, you could be actually, there's a PLC equivalent making a hundred million and he's making seven figures and, uh, thinks like he, if he went for the, any director role, marketing director, operations director, commercial director, <laughs> any role he'd be just the best person for the job and he's kind of nearly looking up to some people so it's it's um yeah it's it's just it's and look at it's it's proven and like if you go through your um go through the isaac index take out maybe the banks and take out ryanair because they haven't really acquired much businesses in a sense um like not in a meaningful sense to get them to where they are but all the other businesses were just smart Irish people like go through them like the Smurfers, the Fives the, the, that were there, the total produce that are there, the um, the um, 
Paddy Power, CRH, um, you've got DCC, um, the, um, you, you, you've all these uh, indigenous Irish companies, you know, the Glambias, the Kerrys, that um, were just smart Irish people who got capital and capital was the enabler and then went and did what they did internationally, Kingspan, they did what they did internationally, and uh, but it was kind of smart Irish people that began two things that changed, they thought global, but they got capital. <laughs> By going on the stock exchange, you're getting capital, you know, like, and let's look at Apple Green as well, and, you know, you're, you're, you're getting, um, so like it's, so it's very simple what they did, you know what I mean, like, and, and people kind of, People and you're trying to say to people here, and that's a big part of our thesis. You're a market leader in Ireland. You're brilliant at what you do. Why don't you take on the UK? It's ten times the size, and there's nobody doing as well as you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought about it, both thought about it. No, come on, like we'll find and fund your acquisition, and uh, you know, because that's what, what all these companies did was acquire for their growth. And uh, there's just a there's a there's just such a latent potential in. Uh, in, 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 in market leaders. There should be some regulation if you're a market leader that you have to fill out a form, you know, have you thought about it? Like, <laughs> do you realize how good you are? Have you thought about acquiring internationally because you sort of kick their ass? And, uh, and generally they have, but they just haven't. It, ne- it, it never gets beyond uh, the conceptual, you know what I mean? Like, because they're kind of probably too busy with the day to day. And that's, um, so it's. It's such a, it's, it, it's an interesting one. Like I said, it's kind of opposed to some of the people. Like if you've ever talked to anyone in Denmark, any of those small companies, they're looking for global domination, you know, um, even if their product isn't or their position isn't there yet, you know. But um, I think, Luke, Luke, in the Nordics, the, the government seem to be quite supportive of startups. Maybe that's given them confidence. Um, one thing, one of the kind of core values of Renatus is that they're passionate about SMEs. Mark, do you think that the Irish government is passionate about SMEs due to how important they are? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so I'm sorry, sorry, because the battery went on from behind. Um, I think, look, at like, I, I, I think um, a lot of people in the roles are doing the best that they can do, like, but in a way, like um is is uh so look at like the the um like you think of the bodies that are out there like the uh like um you know like Julie Cinnamon Enterprise Ireland and the people in ISIF and all that like they're 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 as smart as you get and they're working harder than anybody so they're kind of uh, so they the the um so there's a lot of people really really doing you know they're probably some of the hardest working semi-state type companies that are out there and some of the smartest. So, so, so there's, um, there's, uh, there's absolutely brilliant people there, but you just stand back. I suppose you question the, um, the first thing is like uh, from a government level. So like, I think, I think from a government level, like the capital tax is, uh, the capital tax is punitive to think like, you know what I mean? Like it's 33%. It's just, it's, it, it compares, woefully to everything else like you know what I mean so it's kind of what we do here we go here we do it and uh, there is a school of thought that says that somebody starting a business day one in a lab kind of think about what my game is going to be or what my tax is going to be uh, it might be as explicit as that but it's kind of I, I think back to the thesis on uh, back to the thesis on um, on entrepreneurs role models are key and then role models have kind of success stories it's there you know what i mean like and, and and capital gains tax holds back some of those success stories as well you know so it might be someone says well will i go and acquire this company in the uk well how does it work well i do that do that then what i do or i sell it and then what do i do Will i get to fucking pay capital tax no it might just be the like that the, at that point you know that business making a million do they get up off their ass and go to the uk it might be CGT that kind of says to them, no, I won't, you know what I mean? Because they just work it through. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? What's the next check? Well, you know what? If, if I'm not getting next, well, why would I? Why would I do it? So, so I suppose the uh, at a high level, um, there's some great people and great organisations helping businesses, and we've got some great help. And um, so, like, I think there's some good stuff there. And um, but at a macro level, like CGT is. 
I, I think the biggest thing people aren't doing for the government aren't doing for business is uh, is inhibiting uh, inhibiting. You know, you've got foreign foreign property funds can come in and invest and get away with no you know the the, the with, with no CGT, but then you get the entrepreneur who gets who gets hammered. You know, mm. who's put in maybe ten years of not getting anything out of it and just that one event is going to be taxed like crazy. Like it seems, seems unfair. Um, yeah. And like, like, yeah, it's, it's like, you look at the sports people, there's a great relief there where, where 40% of the tax sports people paid in the last 10 years, they get it back. Brilliant. They deserve it. They're, they're, they're like heroes. They're part of the, 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 the fabric of Ireland and it's a great initiative, but like entrepreneurs should be heroes and treated as such, like not as kind of uh, like it's from a startup base like that. And, and, and don't tell me they did it for the money. You know what I mean? Like in the sense that, it's not, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, uh, it's always a challenge or whatever, but when you get there, you want to, you know, when, 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 um, when you get there, I think it should be rewarded accordingly. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not fair. Yeah. CGT. They probably, they probably roll it into the next business anyway. That's the, the nature of the, those types of people. Anyway, they want to, it would be good for the economy for those the people who are the most productive of capital to to have as much as possible. Maybe just a thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah and look at the, the, the yeah the, the so at a bigger level people can structure such, but it's the kind of it's it's the smaller one that gets caught. You know what I mean? Like like if 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 you're in for a gain of fifty or hundred million, you're going to get super advice and and structured in such a way that you end up not paying CGT. But if you're in for a gain of one or two million, you're you're, you're going to get hammered. I think it should be it should be looked at. Um, Mark, one thing when when you think of Renatus, you think of the well, it's a great brand. A branding is obviously important. We talked about that with Bujum, but the the newsletter that's a big part. You know, that's the first kind of thing I would have, before, before I even kind of looked more into Renatus. Tell us a bit about the newsletter and and how that came about, and was that inspired by your 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 time previously in, in the news industry? Yeah, a little bit. I suppose that my, my um, it, it evolved. It's, it's probably there's been a number of uh, versions, if you like. That they a friend of mine was training horses in France, and horse trainers are notorious for um, kind of not keeping their owners up to date with what's happening with their horse. And I said, "Are you communicating to your owners?" And he said, "Are you communicating to your investors?" He said, "That's actually a fair point. Not really. <laughs> you know what I mean?" So. Uh, so I started doing a thing where I got up on a Sunday morning, got a, looked at a few papers, said, "Here's." A lot of them were expats abroad and kind of reviewed a couple of the, some of the papers that this is what's in it. Sent it BCC 10 people. This was five years ago, 2015. They loved it, sent it to their friends. It just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And then we ended up with a database of nearly 30,000. And, uh, and then we kind of became victims of our own success in it in that the, uh, some of the journalist community kind of said, um, uh, we were kind of the reason why newspaper sales were declining. It's look at you could you could uh, um, did they have an argument possibly, but uh, there was also a counter argument that it was kind of it was uh, it was very much interpreting what was there, and, and a lot of people went and bought newspapers on the back of seeing a summary to say Baker and Curry had set up a new a new business. You know what I mean? Like and it's it's and then goes out and and, uh, and, and and buys it. You know so. There was, uh, but anyway, that was where it was at. We were getting up as a team. There was only five of us at the time, and it was a three or four person shift. And um, we were getting up on a Sunday morning at six o'clock to do this. It was, you know, it was a ten-hour collective shift, and it worked well. So when we got, when journalists were questioning, "Is this?" We're actually, you know, from my supposed to have massive respect for the journalist community. Like that wasn't. We weren't setting out to free ride on anyone's uh, lunch, and uh, so we said we'd pivot it. And what what's our audience interested in? They're interested in M and M and A deals. They're interested in where people are going, and they're interested in fundraising. And the amazing thing was when we brainstormed at the start, some people said, "There's not going to be enough deals." You know what I mean? There's not going to be, and there's been at least five a week, nearly. Like you know what I mean? So it's uh, yes, yeah, so it's been great. It's been um, it's been uh, it's it, it's a great way to uh, not just that. If we if 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 we sent it to one person, it's been great because it kind of forced us every week to kind of really uh, really tune into what's going on and uh, ourselves. You know, some of the younger team in the office reviewing the accounts and you're teaching them how to look at what's happening in cash and you're looking at what's happening there and that. So it's just uh, it's it's again it's a, it's probably a ten hour shift, but we've seven hours done by Friday evening and we get it out. But it's we love it. <laughs> you know, it's 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 uh, 
if there was an audience of one, we'd still do it and send it because it's just uh, it's it's our subject matter and and, uh, and and we love it. I I think every every business should be doing that, including my own. <laughs> you know, but it's it is it's a slog. It's an extra thing to do. It is, and if you're not doing it right, there's no point in doing it at all. So, Baker, you're 100 percent right. Like a lot of our customers in HubSpot, like a HubSpot is a for the the main thing that it does is communicate by email, you know, through different workflows and stuff like that. So all of our customers are looking to communicate with their their you know database. But if it's just very much about them, that's not really news that anyone if it's just like an advertising, it doesn't really work very well. So it has to be something that's valuable. I've got a, a, signed up to a few different uh, newsletters that I read every single time. So that that it's still there. I know marketers have kind of destroyed a lot of the uh, the people's inbox with just uh, just junk that you'd never read. But I consider there's, there's kind of two types. Yeah, of and I suppose we, we've kept. <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Yeah, we, we, I, th- I think in our own, like we can improve it, and we're going to do focus groups and try and uh, sharpen it up a bit. But the uh, we've really gone for editorial neutrality as such, because then, like if our com- if a competitor does a deal, we'll cover it. Like you know what I mean. So we're probably promoting our competitor to to somebody else. But it's it's kind of we're just gone keep it keep the and that's keep it kind of neutral and not biased, and um, and that's kind of that's I think that's that people accept that that it's it's uh, uh so it, it it it's really you know the FT have their tagline without fear and without favor but I think you know there's a lot to be learned from the newspaper industry as to what content can be used for marketing but you really got to have independent independent content that has kind of editorial quality as opposed to kind of oh so 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 you know. I think when, when I when I get an email into my inbox, I consider it's either value or spam. It's one or the other, and it's a fine line. So you have to you, you literally have to give value. You can't have to it. Hundred percent. Hey Baker, uh, we're coming up on an hour, believe it or not. I know I want to be respectful of uh, of Mark's time here. We Mark, we usually do this at the end of the uh, at the end of the podcast just to give the the, the listeners a bit of a, a view in, into the mind of our guest uh, here. Uh, we've got kind of like a standardized few questions that we just kind of throw out there. They're quick questions, but they don't have to be quick answers. Uh, but Mark's, Mark's kind of, this is his, his kind of party piece here. <laughs> okay. What what apps do you use the most? This is going to be controversial. Um with Mr. Hubscott here, but uh, Salesforce is probably uh, <laughs> Salesforce is probably one. Uh, <laughs> Salesforce, uh, Salesforce, <laughs> uh, FT, um, Salesforce, FT, Racing Post, and Bougie. Nice. nice. What's What's the best business idea you never acted upon? Maybe Maybe you personally. Any Any idea? Maybe back in the college days or something. Uh, no, it's it's a good idea. I, I, I suppose in Racing Post, um, I think it's still there. The guys are, are chasing it now, and it's it's uh, like racing's an interesting thing where you've got um, um, you know, a lot of say owners of countries have their horses everywhere, you know what I mean? Like from the Qataris to the Dubai to the Queen to, to you know, the, the, the uh, royalty. And there's no real standardized kind of database. There are versions of it, you know what I mean? But there's no, uh, there's no one-stop shop. Like you get one version if you have a horse running in, in England or Ireland, you have one version if you have a horse running in France, and there's one version if you have a horse running in, but there's no absolutely comprehensive service on who's the daddy, who's the mummy, the pedigrees all the way. You've got you've got kind of fragmented offerings, which are all good in in in, in isolation, but you've just no one writers for that. And that's uh that's probably um and, and there are you know, there's a few business plans in play and I'd imagine it'll be solved in the next in the next few years, but definitely um you know, the best businesses solve problems and that's one kind of opportunity that's that's kind of that, that, that's there and, and would have liked to have kind of nearly stayed a few more years and, and, and gone for it like, you know, there. 
and like, uh, and and then the well. other. Sorry, Luke. No, no, go ahead. Uh, the other one is is um, I do think there's because we do it at a bigger level. Uh, I think there's 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 a uh, crowdfunding is a bit too public, <laughs> in a sense that uh, I think the big gap out there for businesses is getting not just money, but smart money. <laughs> so like in Bougian, we brought the head of retail from Paddy Power in with us as an investor, and he's been brilliant because he's brilliant on site selection, market research, keeping the culture cool, but running the business and scaling it. And he's been great, we brought an aviation guy in with us in SimTech, and that's what we do. We bring kind of experts in, and the amount of people we meet who want to have, like if you name the top 10 Irish legends uh, we've been privileged to probably meet a few of them and they're kind of saying, yeah, if you find something, I'd like to throw a few bob in and help them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or they, they really want to, they've made their money, not, they don't want a day job. They want to, they'd love to, they'd love to throw their money in and, 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 uh, and that matching of, so here you've got a business that's kind of, um, here you have a business that kind of needs money, a couple of hundred grand, you know, that's where, that's below our level. You know what I mean? Like it's, and here you've got someone who's, wants to put a couple of hundred grand in the business. So there is just something there, I think, to, to, to match the, the need with smart money. You know, and it's not like putting your, you know, it's, it's, there's some great offerings on the crowdfunding side and everything else, but it's, it's, it's more sophisticated than that in the sense that you're kind of trying to, you're putting a matching, which is what we do at a bigger level. You know, you're matching people to the opportunity. But uh, I think that's one that's kind of, that's an itch that's there. That look, we're we're doing what we're doing. It's core for the next number of years, so we won't, we won't be doing it at the at the sub a million profit levels. But it's 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 there, like you know, because it's just it's and that's what people have to realise when they're raising money. It's a tender. It's not all on price. You know what I mean? Like it's on quality. Of mm-hmm. What can someone do to bring you to the next level as well? You know. Yeah. Really? No. Spot on. Um. Is it is it who you know or is it what you know? Um, well, I, I suppose the, the better way to ask it, I think, is what, 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 how do you weight them? <laughs> you know? uh, how do you weight them? Because uh, it's definitely um, there's a lot of people. If you if you do do anything without people, you'll do nothing. You know what I mean? And if you just think it's it's your network without without that, it's it's. Uh, so it's clearly both, but it's it's it's. I don't want to sit in the sense, but it, it's it's mixing the it's mixing the um, it's 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 mixing it. Um, like it's I, I've yet to meet a business that someone could go on an island and um, someone could go on a desert island and set it up. You know what I mean? Like so, it's it's businesses through people, and you go nowhere without it. But um, but like that'll get you in the door. But. A bit like it was good. I think it was David Walsh networks. Networks said a great thing about the Irish in America that you get in any door, but like that's it. You're in the door. You now have to sell. <laughs> so, uh, so I think who you know will kind of get you in a door, but uh, what you know will will will, will, will get you to the next stage. Great answer. Hey, Mark Baker. Uh, one more question, then we'll wrap it up. I'll let Mark back to his day. Okay. Um, what book would you recommend to the the eighteen year old Mark? Um, I, I think the eighteen year old. I, I think the biography of an entrepreneur in your in your vertical. You know what I mean? Like so, it's 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 because they'll inspire. You know what I mean? Like that's the that's the because like what what might be what, what what might be for me Warren Buffett might be something else for someone else. You know what I mean? Like yours might be mm-hmm. Picasso, but I, I I just think I think pick your hair, pick, pick stand back. I think to the eighteen year old, who do you want to be when you're fifty? And and the biography of that person is is the biography of that person is the book they should read. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, Mark Flood, thanks very much for joining us on the, the Shark Pod today. Great look inside the, the, the industry for our, for our listeners. And uh, I know we went over a little bit of time today, but it was just so interesting to talk about um, businesses in Ireland. Uh, we're big promoters of what we can do here. 
Um, there's so many examples that you listed off there that are, that are incredibly uh, successful. They just, those companies just needed a, a little bit of capital and it was just smart Irish people who were, were uh, at the helm. So thanks very much for coming along today. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks, thanks Mark. Luke and Mark. Uh, keep up the great work. Cheers. Cheers.